Hello. Okay, let's begin our discussion today. Uh, we are going to talk about reinforcement learning from today onwards. So no more, no more deterministic problems. So there are two uh, separate situations where reinforcement learning is very useful. One is when the state and action spaces are very, very large. So you can't really, so even if you know the model, even if you know the state transition function, as well as the cost function, you cannot really run the entire algorithm on a single machine. Or it's going to take a lot of time if you run it on a single machine. So therefore, you have to distribute the load of computation. And uh, that leads to model-based reinforcement learning problems. So in this case, the transition probability, j given s, a, and c, sorry, j given i, comma, u, c, i, u, j are known. And that's known as model-based uh, situations. And we are going to talk about asynchronous algorithms, asynchronous, asynchronous, VI and PI. Okay, so in that case, you can exploit the knowledge of these models to distribute the load of computation over multiple servers, uh, introduce some amount of asynchrony, but uh, still get some convergence guarantee about the solution. Okay, the other part of reinforcement learning, which is known as model free. RL, the problem is P of J given I U C I U J, these are unknown. Okay, and simulator or data is available. So either you have a simulator for your state for, for your entire system, or you have a lot of data available through regular sources, okay? So some of the very cool problems that I found in model free RL involves the, the trying to control the pitch of the blade of, a, what's that, wind, wind farms, okay? So the problem in wind farms is you have a large number of uh, wind turbines um, in, a, in a large geographical area, but because of the way turbine moves, it sort of creates some turbulence in the air, in the flow of the air, and that creates a lot of problem in figuring out how to control this whole ensemble of wind turbines. So the issue there is if you want to know what uh, turbine pitch angle you can pick in order to get the best performance from all the turbines across the entire wind farm. Uh, it's very difficult to get the transition probability model uh, and it's very difficult to get the cost uh, based on the individual actions you might have taken for one or two turbines, right? So modeling the cost is very difficult, modeling the transition probability is very difficult, uh, but you have a lot of data. Okay, so GE Energy, for instance, they have, they, they run a lot of maybe 50,000 wind turbines all over the US or all over the North America region. So Mexico, US and Canada. And they have this contract with the wind farm owners that whatever data the wind farm generates, it, get, it comes to GE. Okay, so GE has some server where they store all the data from all the wind farms in North America. So they have maybe petabytes of data on wind turbines for several years for different conditions, environmental conditions. Uh, so how can you use that data to come up with a better control strategy for wind turbines? So the idea is you look at the velocity of the air that's coming in, and based on that, you figure out what the pitch angle for individual blade should be for the entire wind farm, okay? So that's a very, very, I, I found it very cool 
for as an application for model free RL. That is not to say that somebody has studied it before. I, perhaps uh, nobody has looked at it before. Or maybe GE is looking into it, we just don't know about it. Okay, so I, I don't know. When I visited GE a couple of years back, then uh, they told me that they have this data available and they want to use it to better control wind farms. So I don't know whether somebody's working on that or not. Okay, so that's a, an example of model free RL where the model is very hard to get and but you do have either a simulator or data. So simulator, if you're looking at city scale transportation system, so Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, for instance, is developing a simulator, a very large scale simulator that tells you how the cars are moving, how the cars and people are moving in San Francisco Bay Area, so that is a very large area and a large number of people. And their microscopic simulator will tell you if, you're, if you block this road, how is the traffic pattern going to change, okay? So that gives the city government a tool to play with to figure out which routes to block at what, what points of time in order to smooth the traffic flow across the city. Okay, so that's a situation where you have a high performance simulator, a simulator that works on supercomputer, but it can give you a very good amount of data very quickly. Very high quality data very quickly. Okay, so that's another application of model free RL where you have a simulator available and you can use it for um, uh, figuring out what optimal policy should be. Okay, so within model free RL, Uh, let's, let's talk about model free RL for some time. So I want to introduce this whole topic right now and then we will talk about asynchronous algorithms. So let's talk about model free RL. The idea in model free RL is uh, you have a sequence of data, so I0, U0, C0, I1, U1, C1, I2, U2, C2, and so on. So you have this trajectory, okay? The trajectory tells you, uh, you could have one trajectory, you could have multiple such trajectory, okay? So I'm just showing one trajectory. So you have this trajectory or episode So this is the data. What's the current state? What action you picked? What's the cost you accrued? What's the next state? Action you picked, the cost accrued, and so on, okay? And you have this long, perhaps infinite sequence of data, or you have a simulator from which you can generate this data, okay? And the question is, can I use this data to come up with mu star? Okay, now of course mu star could come in two ways. Either you compute the optimal Q function, optimal value function, or you use policy iteration type algorithm to compute the optimal mu star. So this is divided into two uh, subparts. So one is on policy algorithms where future actions are perturbed version or perturbed output from from the current policy okay and so you essentially continue to change your policy perturb it slightly for the future, for estimating the value of future actions, and that's how you develop uh, a reinforcement learning algorithm. And the example for this is SARSA, uh, which we are going to talk about today. Okay, so SARSA stands for State Action Reward State Action. I, I don't know why someone picked that name, but that's the name that's that that algorithm has, okay? So it's an on, an on policy algorithm where the future actions comes from a perturbed version of your current policy. Of course, the policy changes over time. 
So that's how you convert, the policy converges to mu star, the optimal policy in the limit. And there are off policy algorithms. where future actions are optimal based on current estimate of j slash q slash v. So either the cost function, q function, or the value function. And the algorithms in this uh, Under this off policy, uh, so off policy RL algorithms are Q learning and then enhanced policy iteration. Okay? And in these two situations, uh, the strategy does not matter. So, sorry, the policy does not matter as long as you visit all these state action pairs infinitely often. So, the policy you use to compute these uh, Q functions or J functions or value functions, it doesn't matter. And then if you want to use a uh, policy iteration type algorithm, so that's, it, it doesn't fit into any of these two uh, situations. So if you want to use policy iteration algorithm, so remember in policy iteration, you have to look at this data and then identify the value of a specific policy. So the, of course the data has to be generated using the policy that you have. So those algorithms are TD lambda and important sampling. <clears throat> important sampling based techniques, based algorithms. So in this, these two algorithms are used to compute JK plus one, which is an approximate value approximated value of j of mu k, the value of using a policy mu k. Yes? Enhanced policy eight, uh, iteration is the same Brutzikis algorithm as last time? It's yes. Not? Okay. Yeah. Because that's a bland enough name that it could be something different. <laughs> no, it's the same Bertzekas. Uh, this is a UN Bertzekas 2012. Sorry, Bertzekas and you. Uh, Bertzekas is the first author. Okay. So the goal for the next three classes, uh, we are going to talk about asynchronous value iteration and policy iteration today. We are going to talk about SARSA, Q learning, and enhanced policy, le policy iteration algorithms today, uh, the off policy algorithms. Uh, we are going to talk about TD lambda and important sampling next week on perhaps Tuesday. And then I'm going to talk about stochastic approximation theorem, which is essentially invoked in proving that all of these algorithms convert. So no matter which algorithm you pick, stochastic approximation theorem is the hammer. You apply that hammer, and you get the convergence result for free. Okay? So we'll talk about it uh, after we have introduced all the algorithms. <clears throat> Now, I'm not going to connect stochastic approximation theorem to prove convergence of each of these algorithms because uh, there are some intricate arguments that needs to be made um, and some condition that needs to be checked. But uh, perhaps one of them will come in your homework so you can 
you can apply it for some simple problem and see for yourself how it is used in uh, proving convergence for these algorithms. Okay, any question? Okay, asynchronous algorithm. So asynchronous VI Pick SK from one to SK as subset of state space. IID. Okay. Actually, I don't need to make it IID, but I'll just keep that there. Uh, you can pick SK any way you want, okay? It need not be IID. Okay. So what is this algorithm doing? I'm picking a few states applying the Bellman operator or evaluating the Bellman operator over only those states. So I only have to do, let's say S was uh, 1 million states, uh, there were 1 million states in the system, but SK is only 5, okay? So I just have to perform 5 minimization at every step of the iteration, okay? Not 1 million minimizations. So remember, T requires you to minimize. For every state, you have to do a minimization operation, right? So it's very complicated. You don't want to do it, so pick 5, 10, 15, 20, 100 states and just do those many minimization and leave the rest, okay? Don't have to update the rest. So this is an asynchronous value iteration, asynchronous because typically you would, uh, what you would do is you will reserve certain number of servers, you store your value function at one server and then you pass on that value function to the multiple servers and you ask them to perform the minimization and send you the result, update the values for those particular states, the states that have been updated by the, by the other servers, okay? So the size of SK would typically depend on the number of servers you have. And the theorem is VK converges to V star. Almost surely. Almost surely. <clears throat> yeah. What does almost surely mean? Oh, that's prerequisite. <laughs> so almost surely means uh, no matter how, uh, so remember this is a random number, right? So SK is a random, not number, but random set of states. So this VK is not a deterministic quantity, it's a random quantity. So no matter how the randomness evolves, VK would still converse to V star along all sample paths. So that's what almost surely means. Uh, yeah, I guess that's a one-line explanation, yeah. So 
are there any conditions on the size of SK? Or Under any condition on the size of SK, the only condition is that all states must be there in SK infinitely often. Okay. So that's why I wrote IID, because if you're using IID, then therefore all the states will be there infinitely often. But uh, it shouldn't be that your SK completely ignores certain part of the state space. Uh, you cannot do that. So all of them have to be updated infinitely often. And the optimal V here means the optimal V. The, the truly optimal V. That results from uh, the, the usual, VI. yeah, usual value iteration, yeah. Okay, so all states must be updated infinitely often. Any other question on value iteration, asynchronous? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, without L providing additional constraints outside the cardinality of SK, yeah. can we say anything about uh, how this will converge speed-wise relative to you know, the synchronous version? Oh, so this will be very slow. But can we characterize that at all other than it's worse? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. At least I haven't seen any paper that characterizes a precise convergence guarantee. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't think so. That that can be done. So if it's very slow, why I use it? Sorry? If it's very slow in conversion. Because it can be parallelized. You can parallelize the whole process. How? So let's consider this problem. You have a uh, you have a value iteration problem, which will take 50 years for a computer to solve. You put 500 computers to that problem, it can be solved in 0 0.1 year, okay. which is a reasonable time frame. And getting 500 computers to solve the problem is not difficult, as long as you can guarantee convergence. Right? So that's what this is trying to do. Something that will take you a lot of time to do, and a lot of memory and all of that technology is not available right now, you can still do it uh, in a somewhat reasonable time frame if you put more resources to it. Okay. So to give you an example, uh, I don't know if you know about AlphaGo's algorithm which played chess with itself and learned how to play chess from no initial con from random initial condition within four hours. But if you look at the computational resources that was used to do things in four hours, if a human has to do that, it'll take him or her probably a million years to get that kind of experience. So in four years, for in four hours, you can get the experience that you would collect over a period of one million years. And that is when you are playing chess every time, like you're not sleeping, you're not eating, you're just playing chess all so the time. So my question was like, um, how, it's, how it can be performing parallel? Oh, so, there are multiple things you can do. You can parallelly update the T operator. So for, let's say your SK was 1, 5, 100, 1,000, and 3, 6, 9, 7. Okay, so this is your SK. So you can ask server number one to update, compute the TVK of state one, ask server number two to update TVK of server number five, sorry, of state five, same thing for 100,000 and 3697. Okay, so you can parallelize it. Why, why I can't do so for the RVI? I can do the same for RVI as well. You can do the same for? For the uh, relative value iteration system. Relative value iteration? The, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you can, can do it for RVI, yeah. So I'm just considering the discounted case now. 
I okay, see. I'm not considering the average case because in average case there are unichain conditions and all other conditions that you need to satisfy. I see. Yeah. So couldn't we also just give entire sets to you know, you know, different servers and then we don't care about the right back conditions if we're saying it's going to occur Correct. infinitely often? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can do that. So this this is an abstraction that considers all those cases. Okay. It's it's a part of this abstraction. There are, of course, asynchronous with some delay and things like that. All of that can be put within a similar framework, and the convergence guarantee would still follow from stochastic approximation theorem. Yeah. Any other question? <clears throat> so this is all for discounted. Uh, most of our uh, our discussions would be on discounted problems from now onwards because the average cost case requires quite a bit of care and then the unichain condition and other conditions needs to be satisfied. Uh, remember there was another condition that was required on the probability transition matrix so it's just a bit more complicated to solve this uh, average cost problems using these algorithms. Okay, asynchronous policy iteration. So, JK plus one I is P mu K JK I I in SK JK I I not in SK So that's the update scheme. Sorry. Uh, oh, I not in SK, of course. I'm trying to check if you can have these SKs different. My feeling is you can completely decouple the two SKs. You don't necessarily have to pick them the same. Okay. Well, in, in neurodynamic program, book, so NDP book, page 32, this is the algorithm that's given, but my feeling is I can, um, I can decouple these SKs completely, but I don't know whether that's correct or not. So I, I think that should be possible, but I'm not sure whether there is convergence proof for that or not. But for this particular algorithm, here is the convergence proof. If mu naught J naught satisfies T mu naught J naught should be less than equal to J naught, then JK converges to V star and mu K converges to mu star almost surely. simply that the initial direction we're heading in for this approach is non-worsening. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So this is uh, the unsatisfactory part 
for policy asynchronous policy iteration, and that's why um, you and Bertsekas uh, proposed enhanced policy iteration. And so there's an asynchronous version of enhanced policy iteration. Asynchronous enhanced policy iteration. They got rid of this hypothesis. So given nu k, which is a policy, R k subset of S cross A S cross U, and then S k, which is a subset of S. such that RK union SK is not a null set. Okay, so you have to update something. You can't have null sets. Update QK plus one IU as FJK nu K QK IU for i comma u in R k, Okay, so those are the three asynchronous algorithms. I mean, there are many more, but these are the basic ones. And then you can have modified asynchronous modified policy iteration and so on. You can have asynchronous modified empirical policy, uh, sorry, enhanced policy iteration. Um, <clears throat> okay. Yes. So there's a difference between asynchronized and synchronized that for synchronized version, if we have like a state of a thousand dimension, we need to solve this system of equation at once. Yes. Whereas in this case, we can. Correct. You can pick and choose. Yeah. You can pick and choose. I have written SK to be IID, okay? But all you require is all states must be updated infinitely often. Or in the case of Q function, all state action pairs must be updated infinitely often. Okay, so you shouldn't exclude certain part of the state space and action space from the update equation. It should appear in your randomization. Of course, if you pick IID, then it will always appear infinitely often with probability one. Sorry? So this is independent and identically distributed. So you pick independent samples of state and use that to update. <clears throat> the cool property of all these algorithms is, oh, the reason why it is model-based, because these are all the usual operators that we are using, 
Okay, so we need to know the model in order to use these operators. If you don't know the model, there's no way you can use these operators. Yeah. So with asynchronous policy iteration, what prevents us as if we have uh, TMU not of uh, uh, J not yeah. equaling J not uh, uh, from having something that stays stationary there? What guarantees is that it will in fact go? Anywhere? So remember, you have this M operator, right? So if, if J0 was equal to J star and mu0 was corresponding mu star, then this will always give you mu star, mu star, mu star forever. Okay, so even if you start with equality, at this particular stage, one of the mu uh, would change and then that would ensure that you always improve and converse to the optimal solution. Okay. Yeah. Because here you're still using the same mu k. So this will not change whatsoever if this was equal. But this is the one that will force things to change if it is not optimal. OK. Any other question? So as you can see here, uh, it doesn't require, it doesn't matter what mu k you pick. OK, it still converges. And it doesn't require any condition like this, OK? So that's the benefit of enhanced policy iteration. OK. So that ends our discussion on model-free reinforcement learning. Sorry, model-based reinforcement learning. Now we'll talk about model-free reinforcement learning. So you know, one thing that I'll, I'll mention here, this are, these are not the only class of model-based reinforcement learning. So um, I was, in the previous uh, semester, I was talking about optimization 5759, and that I taught a lecture on uh, approximate dynamic programming. And a lot of model-based reinforcement learning is essentially applying approximate dynamic programming coupled with some of these uh, techniques to solve complicated optimization problems, dynamic optimization problems. So, um, so you know, all these fields undergo a name change after every 10 years. So 10 years later, this whole thing will be known by some other name. I don't know what that name would be. OK, so right now, so in 1990s, it was approximate dynamic program. Now we call it model-based reinforcement learning. 10, 15, 20 years later, we'll call it by a completely different name. I don't know what that name would be. OK. Uh, Maybe one of you can coin such a name, and then I'll teach it in the class after 20 years. OK. Let's talk about. Uh, Q learning. So before I talk about Q learning, I want to talk about tapering step size. So beta k will be called tapering if summation of beta k equals to infinity, summation of beta k square is finite. Okay, so examples. One over k, one over square root of k, one over k log k, c one over c two plus k, c one over c two plus k log k, and so on. Oh, log k over k. These are all examples of tapering step size. Yes? 1 over square root k, when we square that, we'll get 1 over k. And that oh, sorry. Is. Yeah, that's true. So k raised to 0 0.5 plus epsilon. Yeah. 
and since this is an ECE class epsilon is a small number okay but positive number Okay, so you have studied this uh, step size selection in uh, in your optimization class, 5759 class. Um, and so you see it appearing again in this particular, in the context of reinforcement learning. Okay, and we'll use this idea in uh, stochastic approximation theorem that we'll prove in the, on next Friday. Okay, so what does Q-learning do? I am given a trajectory, I0, U0. So C0 is, how should I write? So CT is basically defined as C of IT, UT, and IT plus one. So I'm going to denote it by CT. So I, I have, I'm given a trajectory, I0, U0, C0, I1, U1, C1, and so on. And I want to map this entire trajectory to computation of Q star. I'm going to assume that all IU pairs, pairs appear infinitely often. Okay, so let me write down the update function. Qt plus one, i comma u. So after I have seen t samples from this sequence, my Qt plus one would be Okay, so one thing you will observe in this, uh, so this is the first model free algorithm that we are talking about. Um, there is no expectation anywhere. There is no, um, yeah, there is no expression for the cost function. So this is what you observe. This is the cost you have observed. It's just a number, 
0 0.5, 0 0.3, 5, 10, 1500, right? So this is just a number. There is no expectation anywhere in this uh, whole uh, update equation. And that's why it's model free. I don't need to know the transition probability. I don't need to know the cost function in order to run this algorithm. That's why it's model free algorithm, okay? The only, so what's this uh, algorithm doing? So I start with some random initial condition. Okay, so Q0 is equal to zero or Q0 is uh, some random vector or random matrix. Uh, I start with Q0. I look at the first cost I have seen. Okay, so this is for I0 and U0. So I'm only going to update the Q table for I0 and U0, and I'm going to leave everything else the same. Okay, so now how, how am I going to update it? So I have QT plus beta T. So beta T satisfies this tapering step size condition. Multiplied by CT, which is the observed cost, plus alpha minimum of the QT for the next state. IT plus one, which I've already observed. This is over U prime and then minus QT of I comma U, uh, where I U is of course I T U T. So maybe I should just write I T U T here, or maybe I can write I T I U and you can infer that it's equal to I T and U T, okay? So this is the update equation for Q function. The theorem is let me just write it here. Beta T tapering implies Q T converges to Q star almost surely. Okay, any question? Yes. Is there an intuition as to why it needs to be tapering and why it can't be a fixed constant? Uh, yes, it'll be clear when we talk about stochastic approximation. Okay. Let me tell you, but that's an important question. So his question is, what if I take beta t equals to constant? Okay. Um, I'll give you an intuition about what happens when beta t is equal to constant, just so you can think about it in your free time. Uh, so this is my Q star. I start from Q zero because I don't know where Q star is, so it could be far away. And let's say I'm using fixed F size, okay? So beta t is equal to constant. Then I am going to go I'm going to do a random walk, get closer to Q star, and then just rotate around Q star. Okay? So I'll get to Q star, but I'm going to just do a random walk around Q star in a neighborhood of Q star. So that's with the fixed step size. When you have tapering step size, what you do, you somehow dampen this movement Okay, so by reducing the step size, you are dampening this movement. So you basically go around Q star and then after that your step size becomes smaller, so you are dampened and then you eventually converse to Q star, okay? So your movement is dampened and you converse to Q star. So this is what happens in a constant step size algorithm. This is what happens in a tapering step size algorithm. Uh, so there are only two, what are the other? I, I don't think there are any other step size selection rules. These are the only two options. Like either you have step sizes that are bounded below by zero or step sizes that are converging to zero. So bounded away from zero step sizes will behave like this. And those that are going to zero, but going to zero at a specific speed will behave like this, okay? Now, if your summation of beta k was finite instead of infinity, 
then you won't even get to Q star. You will just stop somewhere in between. Okay, because you cannot take infinite length step sizes uh, if beta k was summing up to a finite value. So, oh, based off that description, uh, this doesn't appear to be, a, as we thought of previously, a contraction in the same way, because otherwise there should be some infinite occurrence where we bounce directly to uh, the point of interest and stay there because it's a contraction. That's right. So this is not a contraction anymore. Okay, so that's why you don't uh, use, you cannot use constant step size. Any, there was another question somewhere here. No? Yeah. Um, what is alpha? Alpha is the contraction coefficient, not contraction coefficient. It's a discount factor. Oh. Uh, alpha is discount factor. So if you are doing stochastic shortest path, of course, alpha will be equal to one. If it was a reward instead of a cost, you will have max here and you will have RT there. Okay, so those are the usual changes you need to make to this algorithm. Okay, everyone clear about this? Constant step size versus decreasing step size? Now, what do you think people use in practice? Sorry? Yeah. I'm just going to use, use some small constant, and then when I get in a ball that isn't changing, I'm going to rerun it with a smaller constant. Yeah, so that's the one that people use. So you are right. They, they are basically using a hybrid approach, but you keep it constant until you see that there is not much improvement happening, and then after that, you reduce the step size and then keep it constant. Okay, so that's the usual modus operandi. That's how most of the neural networks are being trained now. Can we make any uh, insight into which version of BK is the best based off something we know about the problem? Ah. Um, because with fixed step size, we can normally make some statement that there is an optimal fixed step size that right. emerges the fastest. Right. Uh, no, you cannot. I mean, let me, let me not put it, let me say that it's not clear at this point of time okay. what would be an appropriate step size. So for instance, I could use one over k or I could use log k over k, but I don't know which one I should use, right? So which one would give me faster convergence? It's not clear, so that's why it's problematic. Any other question? Okay, so that's uh, Q learning. Let's talk about enhanced policy iteration. So this is model-free EPI. This is number one. Oh, another thing I wanted to tell you, it doesn't matter which policy is uh, generating this entire sequence. The po this algorithm is policy agnostic and that's why it's called, called off policy reinforcement learning because it doesn't matter which policy you use to generate this entire trajectory. It will still converge to Q star. Uh, as long as all state action pairs are visited infinitely often. So let's say you pick a policy in which a certain action is never visited. So then this Q function will not converge. So I have to choose all actions. You have to pick all actions. Okay, so I'll, I'll tell you where this, this is problematic. So we were doing a, trying to learn um, driving on the road from scratch. I have to break the traffic signal infinitely often to learn the Q function, okay? I know from the very beginning, before the simulation starts, I should not um, uh, jump the red light, but I have to force my algorithm to jump the red light infinitely often in order to learn the Q function, okay? So that's a, that's a problem that people face with. So if they want to run the true Q function, of course you can you can try to use heuristics to make sure that you never jump a red light, but then that's not running a Q-learning algorithm. Can I take this action out of my set, of action set? You can perhaps take it out of your action set, but it's not clear how you would do that, okay? Because right before the traffic light, you still have to be able to drive. So then you will have to 
basically vary the speed limit. Now what happens is as soon as the light turns green, then suddenly your speed limit changes from zero miles per hour to 35 miles per hour, right? So there is a sudden jump in the speed limit at that particular location. So there are all these issues that you need to think about when you start running such simulations. So applied, it's basically saying to learn morality, you have to commit all sins independently often. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What, what, what do you do if you're building some sort of simulation or using some existing simulation and it's not covering uh, the full area to induce it into the simulation center? Do you just have to build go back to the simulation and include those like yes. if you have cata uh, catastrophe events. Yes. And do you just say the model breaks or do you have to build the catastrophes into the You simulation? have to build the catastrophe in the model. Okay. Because what happens before the catastrophe also is important. So you don't jump the red light. You are already at a very high speed before the red light comes and that's why you have to jump the red light because you cannot accelerate with infinite deceleration. So Right, so, so, so there are events that happens which leads to catastrophe, and that has to be part of the simulation model. Okay, so you can't just arbitrarily put in some catastrophe case at anywhere you want in the sequence just to make it hit um, infinitely often? Or? You can do that, but that's a heuristic. That's not Q-learning. Okay. Okay, that's a heuristic on top of Q-learning which helps your algorithm to converge faster but it's not the true Q-learning as mentioned on the board, okay? Then uh, model-free uh, enhanced EPI. Uh, JK plus one, I equals to min Oh, I'm using T. So JT plus one I, QT, I comma U, U and U, I is equal to IT, JT I, I not equal to IT. So that's how you update the J function and then pick U prime T according to new T IT Okay, so this update scheme is very similar to this update scheme except that this min over u prime is replaced with min over jt comma qt. So this was the, uh, this is an inherent part of the uh, uh, enhanced policy iteration. So that remains the same. Everything else is very similar to that. Beta t is tapering and that's it. So this is very straightforward 
this is uh, part of EPI, so this is the description of EPI. So we are doing the same thing here. This is, of course, straightforward. Again, the theorem is if all state action pairs are visited infinitely often, this would converge to uh, uh, Q star and J star almost surely. So the minimization, is that over I or what is that over? Uh, this, oh, th these are, this is a real number, this is a real number, I'm taking the minimum of two real numbers. Oh, okay. Okay. So not over anything. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And picking UT prime from what? From what? Sorry? So you are saying, say EPI. You pick, pick UT dash? Yes. What does it mean? So remember in the empirical, uh, sorry, in enhanced policy iteration, there is a new T policy that you pick. It's part of the description of en enhanced yeah. policy iteration. So, so typically this minimization, you have an expectation over this U prime T. Okay, so let me write down the description of enhanced policy iteration. Hopefully it will make it clear. So the f j nu of q is c summation j in s p i j u c i u j plus summation u prime nu of u prime given j min of j j comma q j comma u prime how do i write it q j comma u prime that's the operator f j nu q okay at i u so this is evaluated at i comma u. So you take the expectation with respect to the future state, and then there is this inner expect, oh, there is an alpha here. Did I miss the alpha? No, I have alpha here, okay. So the, in the algorithm, you have the summation over u prime of nu of u prime given j. So instead of taking the summation, I'm just picking a sample u prime t and replacing the expectation here with uh, qt of it comma u prime t. That's it. Okay? So there's no expectation here. <clears throat> Any other question? Yeah. And then what in practice does this gain us as opposed to the, well, above the q learning model for? for uh, it's, not, it's not clear at this moment. Remember, this was proposed in 2012. And this was proposed in response to um, the policy iteration condition. Remember, there was asynchronous policy iteration. We had this condition that T mu naught of J naught should be less than or equal to J naught. So this was developed in response to removing that hypothesis in the convergence argument. Okay, now, how does this algorithm perform in comparison to Q-learning? Uh, one of you should take it up as a research project in this class. So does it require, if so, like I and U appears? So of course, in this case, you are, uh, you are, you are storing Rs cross, uh, a, a vector in Rs and a vector in Rs cross A, uh, sorry, Rs cross U. And in this case, you just have a vector or a matrix in Rs cross U. So in some sense, the storage requirement is much smaller here in comparison to this one. No, I mean, does it require the conditions that all I and U appears, appears in Of course, yeah, 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 yeah. That's always the case. It's the case for all. Yeah, yeah, that's the case for all algorithms. All state action pairs must be visited infinitely often. Okay. <clears throat> um, this is again model free because what, what algorithm you pick, so what policy you pick doesn't matter. Okay, what policy you pick for generating this trajectory, uh, it doesn't matter 
in running this algorithm. Oh, I can see one benefit here. I have to do the minimization between two real numbers versus minimization over the entire action set. Okay, so that's one benefit I can clearly see. But I think quicksort is pretty fast algorithm. So finding a minimum in an array is perhaps a very easy operation. Oh yeah, of course you have to do it here. Okay, so maybe uh, maybe there is not much benefit. I don't know. <laughs> That's true. You are still doing a minimum here. Um, I think you can do this uh, less often. You don't have to do it at every time step. You can do it once in a while. Um, it's not it's not proven, but I'm saying that based on my experience, I think that that can be done without hurting the performance of the algorithm. But again, someone has to verify it empirically on five or six different test beds. OK. All right, any other question? Yeah. So all these algorithms, they are, in some sense, asynchronous. Uh, they are extreme case of asynchronous, because you are, gen well, uh, yeah, but remember in asynchronous you could compute the operator t and t mu and all that stuff. Here you cannot compute even that, right? So you just have a trajectory. That's it, that's all that's given to you. And you have to come up with these functions based on that trajectory that's given to you. Uh, yeah? Could you parallelize this by having, assuming <coughs> you have the infinite length trajectory, yeah. could you have different servers start at different parts of that trajectory yes. and then start combining the results? Uh, not different parts of the trajectory, but you can have two different simulators generating the two trajectories and you can combine the two results uh, parallelly. Okay. okay. But you can't use the same trajectory and start from different starting points. I, I don't know whether that would, uh, nobody has studied it, at least it's not there in any of the books. So I don't know what the convergence guarantee is, but if you want to pick it up as a research topic, you'll feel, feel free to do so. What is, what is possible is to have multiple such trajectories and use that to parallelly update the Q function. And that's much faster mm -hmm. in comparison to running this algorithm. Uh, yeah. In fact, uh, you know, the funny that you asked me, one of the leading researchers in reinforcement learning, Ben Van Roy, he's a faculty at Stanford, and he gave a talk in which he's doing the same thing. He's running multiple simulations in parallel and updating the Q functions together. I mean, maybe not him, but his students are doing it, but you know, he presented that work, so it was pretty cool. Okay, so now I'm going to do on policy reinforcement learning, which is SARSA. Uh, okay, so there is SARSA lambda, but I'm going to talk about SARSA zero today. Okay, so what's the algorithm? Qt plus one, it ut. Oh, uh, I hope it won't be confusing. Well, let me just write it as a.
then CT is just the cost function at IT mu yes. and then Yes, IT plus one. Okay. Yeah. Summation I think the summation should be over all P. Maybe I should put I here. Uh, AT has to, AT converges to infinity as T goes to infinity. Oh, I have used V already, so let me put U prime. So what's the salient feature of SARSA? So SARSA looks at the Q function at the future state and action pair, but then the action is picked according to, uh, I mean, this is not the only policy, but this is one of the policies you can use to pick UT plus one. Uh, but it has to be Exploring again, so all state action pairs must be visited, so this policy satisfies that assumption. And this mu t should converge. So let me, let me try and ask you, what happens when a t goes to infinity? So what happens when t is very, very large and a t is very close to infinity? So what does mu t, where does mu t put all its weight? Okay, so my question is, t is large, a t is very large, where does mu t put all its weight? Where qt is zero? Where qt is zero, right? Uh, because zero is the only thing that will get you the... No, but this is exponential over sum of exponential, right? So... But those should vanish. So if there is a small number here, there'll be a small number here too but then there'll be other small numbers too. So what will happen? So let me just write down, uh, let me just erase this. So when you go back, you can think about it, mu t, so if t is large, implies a t is large, which would imply that mu t of u star i given i comma q will be approximately equal to one where u star i is argmin u in u q of i comma u. So this will be approximately equal to one. Won't that be because one of them is driving QT to zero, and then that's the one that- It's not be. driving to zero. Why would QT get driven to zero? Because that's it, the only thing that will beat the negative infinity out, or is it just relative ratios that- will No, that's just algebraic thing. So let me, let me give you an example. So let's say my AT was equal to 
let us just pick two, two values of u. Where can I write it? I will write it there. So I am going to pick two values of u and let a t be equal to 100. Then uh, and let us say q of i comma 1 is 50, q of i comma 2 is 100. Then mu t of 1 would be exponential minus 5000 over exponential minus 5000 plus exponential minus 10,000. What is this equal to? Almost 1 because exponential minus 10,000 is like order of magnitude smaller than exponential minus 5000. So this is almost equal to 1. On the other hand, mu t of 2 would be almost 0 because that is 1 minus mu t of 1. So mu t of 2 is exponential minus 10,000 over exponential minus 5,000 plus exponential minus 10,000. Okay, so this is almost equal to 0. And that is exactly what is going to happen in this case also. Yeah. Uh, so with the QT plus 1 calculation, is that getting impacted at all by us updating mu t or? Yes, it, it, it does because this action will get updated because of the choice of mu t you pick. Okay, so the action is, is being generated according to the correct, policy. Correct, correct. So that's why it's on policy, on policy. Okay. okay, so the action is generated according to the updated policy. The policy gets updated according to the Q function. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so the theorem is QT converges to Q star almost surely. Again, because of stochastic approximation theorem and the fact that beta t is a tapering step size. In all the algorithms we have talked about, beta t is allowed to vary with i and u. So beta t could be a function of i or i comma u as long as it uh, satisfies the tapering step size condition. Yes? Uh, so SARSA requires you to be able to change so Q learning is off policy, which means G has given you data. You can run Q learning to learn the optimal policy. But for SARSA, you need to have a simulator, you need to have a system so that you can continually change the policy and simulate the next action and the cost function. In this case, we can also do the same for Q if, if we are allowed to change the policy, we can also change the sample policy for the Q learning? Uh, no, but Q learning, so you can run Q learning. Uh, so if you, if, you, if you run Q learning with changing policy, then it is SARSA. If you run SARSA with a static policy, well, you can't run SARSA with a static policy. It has to change because then it will converge to Q star. But I'm, what I'm saying is for Q learning to work, you don't need to have a data generated from a specific policy, in order for SARSA to work, you need to interact with the system or interact with a simulator ev every so often in order to be able to run this algorithm. Okay, I, I don't know if that makes sense. I, I feel like if you can run SARSA, you can also run Q-learning. Oh yeah, you can al also run Q-learning, yeah, that's true. So if this requires interactivity with the system and Q learning and model free API does not, right. uh, can we say anything about uh, SARSA having better qualities in some ways or why wouldn't we just generate the long vector to begin with and run the other option? You know, I, I haven't seen a comparative study of these algorithms. Okay, so I'm, I'm at a loss on answering some of these questions because uh, nobody has done a comparative study for a large number of systems, which I guess this class can do, or at least, you, you know, if you can run all these algorithms for the same system, for the same set of step sizes, under differing 
for different algorithms and try and compare which one converges faster and under what conditions they converge faster, that would be a very cool exercise. So I'll leave it up to you to think about it because all of these are challenging questions and good for a course project. <laughs> but not for thesis, unfortunately. How can you turn off, turn off the thing? I'll be doing my thing here, so that is